Chapter One of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Witherup by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One Nansen Anne Warrington Witherup read by k hand nansen read by nemo publisher read by chuck williamson ticket agent read by phone it was in the early part of february last that acting under instructions from headquarters i set forth from my office in london upon my pilgrimage to the shrines of the world's illustrious readers everywhere are interested in the home life of men who have made themselves factors in art science letters and history and to these people i was commissioned to go but one restriction was placed upon me in the pursuit of the golden notoriety and that was that i should spare no expense whatever to attain my ends at first this was embarrassing wealth suddenly acquired always is but in time i overcame such difficulties as beset me and soon learned to spend thousands of dollars with comparative ease and first of all i decided to visit nansen to see him at home, if by any possibility Nansen could be at home anywhere, would enable me to open my series interestingly. I remember distinctly that upon his return from the North Pole he had found my own people too cold for comfort. I called to mind that, having travelled for months seeking the Pole, he had accused my fellow countrymen of coming to see him out of mere curiosity, and I recalled at the same time that with remarkable originality he had declared that we heated our railway trains to an extent which suggested his future rather than his past wherefore i decided to visit nansen to hear what else he might have to say while some of the incidents of his visit were fresh in our minds the next thing to discover the decision having been reached was as to nansen's whereabouts nobody in london seemed to know exactly where he might be found i asked the manager of the house in which i dwelt and he hadn't an idea he never had for that matter then i asked a policeman and he said he thought he was dancing at the empire but he wasn't sure next i sought his publishers and asked for his banker's address the reply included every bank in london with several trust companies in france and spain to my regret i learned that we americans hold none of his surplus but where do you send his letters i demanded of his publisher in despair Dr. Nansen has authorized us to destroy them unopened, was the reply. They contain nothing but requests for his autograph. But your letters coming to him containing his royalties? Where do they go? I demanded. We address them to him in our own care, was the answer. And then, I queried? According to his instructions, they are destroyed unopened said the publisher twisting his thumbs meditatively it seemed hopeless suddenly an idea flashed across my mind i will go i thought to the coldest railway station in london and ask for a ticket to nansen a man so fastidious as he is in the matter of temperature i reasoned cannot have left london at any one of their moderately warm stations where the temperature is most frigid there nansen must have gone when leaving he is such a stickler for temperature Wherefore I went to the Waterloo station. It is the coldest railway station I know, and asked the agent for a ticket for Nansen. He seemed nonplussed for a moment, and, to cover his embarrassment, asked, uh, Second or third class? First, said I, putting down a five-pound note. Certainly, said he, handing me a ticket to Southampton. Do you think you people in the States will really have a war with Spain? I will not dilate upon this incident. Suffice it to say that the ticket man sent me to Southampton, where he said I'd be most likely to find a boat that would carry me to Nansen. And he was right. I reached Sidgwickich within twenty-four hours, and holding, as I did, letters of introduction from President McKinley and Her Majesty Queen Victoria, from Richard Crocker and Major Pond, Mr. Nansen consented to receive me. He lived in an Eskimo hut on an ice floe which was passing the winter in the far-famed Maelstrom how i reached it heaven only knows i frankly confess that i do not i only know that under the guidance of svenskold bonsjan i boarded a plain pigeon raft such as the norwegians use and was pigeaddled out into the seething whirlpool in the midst of which was nansen's more or less portable cottage 
When I recovered, I found myself seated inside the cottage, which, like everything else in the maelstrom, was waltzing about as if at a military ball or Westchester County dance. Well, said my host, looking at me coldly, you are here. Why are you here? Mr. Nansen, said I. The very same, said he, taking an icicle out of his vest pocket and biting off the end of it. The polar explorer, I added. There is but one Nansen said he, brushing the rhyme from his eyebrows. Why ask foolish questions? If I am Nansen, then it goes without saying that I am the polar explorer. Excuse me, I replied. I merely wish to know. And then I took a one-dollar bill from my purse. Here, Mr. Nansen, is my dollar. That is, I understand, the regular fee for seeing you. I should like now to converse with you. What is your price per word? Have you spoken to my agents? he asked. No, said I. Then it will only cost you a hundred and sixty dollars a word. Had you arranged through them, I should have had to charge you two hundred dollars. You see, he added apologetically, I have to pay them a commission of twenty per cent. I understand that, said I. I have given public readings myself, and after paying the agent's commission and traveling expenses, I have invariably been compelled to go back and live with my mother for six months. Miss Witherup, said Nansen, rising. You did not intend to do it, and I therefore forgive you. But for the moment you have made me feel warmly towards you. Please do not do it again. Frigidity is necessary to my business. What can I do for you? Talk to me, said I. He immediately froze up again. What about? said he. The pole? No, said I, about America. I cannot, he cried despairingly. I do not wish to dwell upon my sufferings. If I told about my American experience, people would not believe. They would rank me with Munchausen. My sufferings were so intense. Let me tell of how I lived on Eskimo dog chops and ice cream for nineteen weeks. Pardon me, Mr. Nansen, said I, but I can't do that. We Americans know all about the North Pole. Few of us, on the other hand, know anything about America, and we wish to be enlightened. What did you think of Chicago? Chicago? Hmm. Let me see, said Nansen, tapping his forehead gently with an ice pick. Chicago. Oh, yes, I remember. It was a charmingly cold city, full of trolley cars and having a newly acquired subway and a public library. I found it a beautiful city, madam, and the view from Bunker Hill's Statue of Liberty was superb, looking down over Blackwell's Island, through the Golden Gate, out into the vast, trackless waste of Lake Superior. Yes, I thought well of it. If I remember rightly, we took in $1,869 at the door. I was surprised at his command of details, and resolved further to test his memory and Philadelphia, Mr. Nansen. A superb city, considering its recency, as you say in English. I met many delightful people there. Senator Tom Reed received me at his palace on Uselet Avenue, if I remember the street aright. The mayor of the city, Mr. McKinley, gave me a dinner, at which I sat down with Mr. Cleveland and Mr. Van Wyck, and Mr. Bryan, and Mr. Pulitzer, and other members of his cabinet and in my leisure hours I found the theaters of Philadelphia most pleasing, with Mr. Jefferson singing his nigger songs, Mr. Mansfield in his inimitable skirt dancing, and best of all, Mr. Daly's Shakespearean revivals of Hamlet and Othello, with the Miss Rayan in the title roles. Oh, yes, Miss Witherdown. Witherup, I snapped coldly. Excuse me, Witherup, said the great explorer. Oh, yes, Miss Witherup, I found America a most delightful country, especially your capital city of Philadelphia. Herr Nansen, said I, are you as accurate in your observations of the North Pole as in your notes of the states as expressed to me? Neither more nor less so, said he somewhat uneasily, I thought. But you have drawn a most delightful picture of the states, said I. I think all Americans will be pleased by your reference to the Bunker Hill Monument at Chicago and Mayor McKinley's cabinet at Philadelphia. On the other hand, you spoke of intense suffering while with us. Yes, said he. I did, because I suffered. 
have you ever traveled in your own country madam i am an american said i therefore when i travel i travel abroad then you do not know of the privations of american travel he cried consider me nansen compelled after the delightful discomfort of the fram to have to endure the horrid excellence of your pullman service consider me nansen after having subsisted on dogs and kerosene oil for months having to eat a breakfast costing a dollar at one of your american hotels consisting of porridge broiled chicken deviled kidney four kinds of potatoes eggs in every style real coffee and buckwheat cakes consider me nansen i inquired yes nansen said he consider me nansen used to the cold of the arctic regions the arctic perils having to wake up every morning in an american hotel or an american parlor car warm without peril comfortable without anything whatsoever to growl about it must have been devilish said i it was said he well mr nansen i put in rising you can stand it you are cold enough to stay in hades for forty-seven years without losing your outside garments how much do i owe you fifteen thousand dollars please said he i gave him the money and swam away good-bye he cried as i reached the outer edge of the maelstrom i hope next time i go to america that i shall meet you many thanks said i when do you expect to come never he replied deo valente charming chap that nansen so warm you know end of chapter one chapter two of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter two mr hall kane anne warrington witherup read by k hand mr hall kane read by chuck williamson hackman read by nemo i do not know why it should have happened so but it did happen that after my interview with nansen i felt gloomy in my soul and hence naturally sought congenial company my first inclination was to run down to greece and take luncheon with king george but when i came to look over my languages the only bit of greek i could speak fluently turned out to be hoi polloi and from private advices i gather that that is the only bit of greek that his honor the king has no use for therefore i bought a ticket straight through to gloomster abbey isle of man the residence of hall kane appropriately enough it was midnight when i arrived it was a moonlight night but there were a dozen clouds on the horizon and directly in the wake of the moon's rays so that all was dark from the abbey itself no single ray of light gleamed and all was still save the croaking of the tree toads in the moat and the crickets on the roof of the parapet anyone else would have been chilled to the marrow but i having visited nansen had to use a fan to overcome the extreme cordiality of the scene with the thermometer at thirty-two degrees i nearly swooned with the heat is this gloomster abbey i asked of my hackman yes said he and for humanity's sake pay your fare and let me go i am the father of seven orphans and the husband of their widowed mother if i stay here ten minutes i'll die and my wife will marry again heaven help her i paid him six pounds ten shillings sixpence and let him go he was nothing to me but his family had my sympathy then i knocked on the portcullis with all my might and was gratified to find that like a well-regulated portcullis it fell and with a loud noise withal an intense silence intervened and then out of the blackness of the blue above me there came a voice with a reddish tinge to it who's there said the voice if you are a burglar come in and rob if you are a friend wait a minute if you are an interviewer from an american sunday newspaper accept my apologies for keeping you waiting 
turn the knob and walk in. I'll be down as soon as I can get there. It was Hall Kane himself who spoke. I turned the knob and walked in. All was still, dark, and cold, but I did not mind, for it fitted into my mood exactly. In the darkness of the corridor within, I barked, what if I were a man, I should call my shins. As it happened, being a woman, I merely bruised my ankles when he appeared. Hall Kane himself. There was no gas light, no electric light, nothing but the blackness of the night, and he appeared. I suppose it was all due to the fact that he is a brilliant man who would shine anywhere. However it may have been, I suddenly became conscious of a being that walked towards me as plainly discernible as an ocean steamship at sea at night, with every electric light burning in the saloon, and the red and green lanterns on the starboard and port sides of its bow. "'Mr. Kane,' said I, addressing his starboard side. "'That's I,' said he, grammatically and with dignity. "'A man less great would have said, "'That's me.' which is why, in the darkness, I knew it was Mr. Kane, and not his hired man I was speaking to, or with, as your style may require. Mr. Kane, said I, not without nervousness, I have come. So I perceive, said he, and then an inspiration came to me. To lay my gloom at your feet, I said, with apparent meekness. It is all I have, but such as it is, you are welcome to it. Some people would have brought you rich gifts in gold and silver. Some would have come with compliments and requests for your autograph. I bring you only a morbid heart bursting with gloom. Will you take it? I appreciate the courtesy, madam, replied the great man, wiping a tear from the end of his nose, which twinkled like a silver star in the blackness of the corridor. But I cannot accept your offering. I have more gloom on hand than I know what to do with. I am, however, deeply touched, and beg to offer you the hospitality of the moat. Unless you have further business with me at my regular rates. A dreadful, blood-curdling wail, like that of a soul in torment, interrupted my answer. It seemed to come from the very center of the earth directly beneath my feet. I was frozen with horror, and my host, with a muttered imprecation, turned and ran off. "'I haven't time to see you now,' he cried, as he disappeared down the steps of a yawning hole at the far end of the corridor. "'I can't afford to miss the experiment for anything so small and cheap as a morbid heart bursting with gloom.' I followed closely after, although he had not granted permission. I didn't feel that I could afford to miss the experiment either, and ere he had time to slam to the door of the dungeon which we ultimately reached, I was inside his workshop.' if it was chill without it was deadly within save that the darkness was not so intense red lights burning dimly in each of the four corners of the dungeon the walls were covered with a green trickling ooze from the moat and underfoot the ground was dank and almost mushy in the very centre of the place was a huge rack a relic of some bygone age of torture and stretched at full length upon it was a man of i should say about forty years of age two flunkies in livery red plush trousers and powdered wigs, now and then turned the screw, and with each turn horrid shrieks would come from the victim, mingled with alternate prayers and curses. "'What on earth is the meaning of this?' I cried in horror. "'It means, madam,' replied the famous author calmly, "'that I never fake. All my situations, all my passages descriptive of human emotions and sufferings, are drawn from life, and not from the imagination. "'You work from living models,' I gasped. "'Why would not a lay figure do as well for torture?' "'Because lay figures do not shriek and pray and curse. I am surprised that you should be so dull. James, turn the thumbscrew three times, and Grimmins, Take your cricket bat and give the patient a bastinado on his right foot. It is a pitiless shame, I cried. It is in the interest of art, madam, said the novelist, shrugging his shoulders. Just as our surgeons have to vivisect for the advancement of science, so must I conduct experiments here in the interest of letters. My new novel has a stirring episode in it, 
based upon the capture and torture of a newspaper correspondent in Tibet. <laughs> I might, I suppose, have imagined the whole thing, but this so far surpasses the imagination that I am convinced it is the better way of getting my color. There isn't any doubt about that, said I, but consider this man here, whose limbs you are stretching beyond all endurance. He should regard it as a splendid sacrifice, vouchsafed the novelist, lighting a cigarette and winking pleasantly at his victim. Is his a voluntary sacrifice? I demanded. <laughs> Rather good joke, <laughs> eh, Rogers? laughed Mr. Kane, addressing the sufferer. This simple-minded little American girl asks if you are there because you <laughs> like it. <laughs> what a troll idea! Thinks you do this for pleasure, Rogers, as an idea you tied yourself on there, and racked yourself at first, so she has. <laughs> Thinks you shriek so as to smother your <laughs> laughter which would be very inappropriate to the occasion <laughs> the sufferer groaned deeply and the novelist turning to me observed <laughs> no madam my poor unhappy friend rogers is here against his will i regret to say it would be far pleasanter for me when i hear him bastinado to know that he derived a certain amount of personal satisfaction from it in spite of the pain but it must be otherwise furthermore in the story the newspaper man who is tortured is not supposed to like it so that accuracy requires that i should have a man like rogers who dislikes it intensely and do you mean to say, sir, that you deliberately went out into the street and seized hold of this poor fellow, carried him in here, and subjected him to all this? Why, it's a crime. Not at all, replied Mr. Kane nonchalantly. I am no common kidnapper. I do not belong to a literary press gang. I have simply exercised my rights as the owner of this castle. This man came on his own responsibility, just as you have come. I never asked him any more than I asked you, and he has had to take the consequences, just as you will have to abide by whatever may result from your temerity. Rogers is a newspaper man, and he tried to get a free interview out of me by deceit, knowing that I no longer do a gratis business. It so happened that I was, at that moment, in need of such a person for my experiment. I gave him the interview, and now he is paying for it. The novelist paused, and after eyeing me somewhat closely for a moment, turned to his notes, lying on his desk alongside the rack, while a tremor of fear passed over me. Curious coincidence, he remarked, looking up from an abstract of his story. In my very next chapter... I take up the sufferings in captivity of a young and beautiful American girl who is languishing and starving in a loathsome cell full of reptiles and poisonous beasts like gila monsters and centipedes. She is to be just your height and coloring and age. I grew rigid with horror. You wouldn't, I began. Oh, yes, I would, replied the author pleasantly. Would you like to see the cell? I would like to see the outside of your castle, I cried, turning to the stairs. The novelist laughed hollowly at the expression of hopelessness that came over my face as I observed that a huge iron grating had slid down from above and cut off my retreat. I am sorry, Miss Witherup, but I haven't got the outside of my castle in here. If I had, I'd show it to you at once, he said. I beg of you, sir, I cried, going down on my knees before him. Do let me go. I— Don't be emotional, my dear, he replied in a nice fatherly way. You will have an alternative when I have receded this, he added, writing out a bill and tossing it to me. When I have receded this, 
You can go. I glanced at the paper. It called for fifteen hundred pounds for an interview of an hour and a half at one thousand pounds an hour. If you will give me your check for that amount, you may go. Otherwise, I am afraid I shall have to use you for a model. I only have twelve hundred pounds in the bank, I replied, bursting into tears. It will suffice, said he. Your terror will be worth three hundred pounds to me in a short story I am writing for the Manx Sunday World. Whereupon I wrote him a check for twelve hundred pounds and made my escape. I'll expose you to the world, I roared back at him in my wrath as I walked down the path to the road. Do, he cried. I never object to a free advertisement. <laughs> bye bye. With that I left him and hastened back to London to stop payment on the check. But in some fashion he got the better of me, for it happened to be on a bank holiday that I arrived, and ere I could give notice to the cashier to refuse to honor my draft, it had been cashed. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Peeps at People, Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Emperor William Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Hand. Emperor William, read by Spoken For. Grand High Chamberlain, read by phone. After recovering from the attack of nervous prostration, which was the natural result of my short visit to Gloomster Abbey, acting on my physician's advice, I left England for a time. Finding myself some weeks later in Berlin, I resolved to call upon His Imperial Highness William II, better known as the Yellow Kid of Potsdam. I experienced some difficulty at first in reaching the Emperor. Royalty is so hedged about by etiquette that it seemed almost impossible that I should get an audience with him at all. He was most charming about the matter, but, as he said in his note to me, he could not forget the difference in our respective stations in life. For an emperor to consent to receive a plain American newspaper woman was out of the question. He could be interviewed incognito, however, as Mr. William Hohenzollern, if that would suit my wishes. I replied instantly that it was not Mr. William Hohenzollern that I wished to interview, but the German emperor, and unless I could see him as emperor, I did not wish to see him at all. I added that I might come incognito myself, if all that was necessary to make the whole thing regular was that I should appear to be on a social level with him, and instead of calling as Miss Witherup, I could call as the Marchioness of Sputen Dewyville, or, if he preferred, Princess of Harlem Heights to both of which titles, I assured him, I had as valid a claim as any other lady journalist in the world, in fact, more so, since they were both of my own invention. Whether it was the independence of my action or the novelty of the situation that brought it about, I do not know, but the return mail brought a command from the Emperor to the Princess of Harlem Heights to attend a royal fete given in her honor at the Potsdam Palace the next morning at twenty minutes after eleven. I was there on the stroke of the hour, and found His Imperial Highness sitting on a small gilt throne, surrounded by mirrors, having his tintype taken. This is one of the Emperor's daily duties, and one which he has never neglected from the day of his birth. He has a complete set of these tintypes ranged about the walls of his private sanctum in the form of a frieze, and he frequently spends hours at a time seated on a stepladder examining himself as he looked on certain days in the past. He smiled affably as the Grand High Chamberlain announced, The Princess of Harlem Heights, and on my entrance threw me one of his imperial gloves to shake. Ha! Oh. He cried as he did so. Ditto hick, I answered with my most charming smile. I hope I do not disturb you, my dear Emperor. Not in the least, he replied. Nothing disturbs us. We are the very center of equanimity. We are a sort of human Gibraltar which nothing can move. It is a nice day out, he added. Most charming, said I. Indeed, a nicer day out than this no one could wish for. We are glad you find it so, madame. Excuse me, sire, I said firmly. Princess. Indeed, yes, we had forgotten, he replied with a courteous wave of his hand. It could not be otherwise. We are glad, princess, that you find the day nice out. We ordered it so. 
and it is pleasant to feel that what we do for the world is appreciated. We shall not ask you why you have sought this interview, he continued. We can quite understand, without wasting our time on frivolous questions, why anyone, even a beautiful American like yourself, should wish to see us in person. Are you in Berlin for long? Only until next Thursday, sire, I replied. What a pity, he commented, rising from the throne and stroking his mustache before one of the mirrors. What a tremendous pity. We should have been pleased to have had you with us longer. Emperor, said I, this is no time for vain compliments, however pleasing to me they may be. Let us get down to business. Let us talk about the great problems of the day. As you will, princess, he replied. To begin with, we were born— Pardon me, sire, I interrupted, but I know all about your history. They study us in your schools, do they? Ah, well, they do rightly, said the emperor with a wink of satisfaction at himself in the glass. They indeed do rightly to study us. When one considers what we are the result of, far back, princess, in the days of Thor, the original plans for William II were made. This person, whom we have the distinguished and sacred honor to be, was contemplated in the days when chaos ruled. Gods have dreamed of him. Goddesses have sighed for him. Epochs have shed bitter tears because he was not yet. And finally he is here in us, incarnate sublimity that we are. The emperor thumped his chest proudly as he spoke until the gold on his uniform fairly rang. Are we, uh, are we appreciated in America? He asked. To the full, emperor, to the full, I replied instantly. I do not know any country on the face of this grand green earth where you are quoted more often at your full value than with us. And, uh... He added, with a slight coyness of manner. We are, uh, supposed to be at what you Americans call par in a premium, eh? Emperor, said I, you are known to us as yourself. Madam, or rather princess, he cried ecstatically. You could not have praised us more highly. He touched an electric button as he spoke, and instantly a buttons appeared. The Iron Cross, he cried. Not for me. Oh, sire, not for me, said I, almost swooning with joy. No, princess, not for you, said the emperor. For ourself. We shall give you one of the buttons off our imperial coat. It is our habit every morning at this hour to decorate our imperial self. And we have rung for the usual thing, just as you Americans would ring for a Manhattan cocktail. What? I cried, wondering at the man's marvelous acquaintance with the slightest details of American life. You know the Manhattan cocktail? Princess, said the emperor proudly, we know everything. And this was the man they call Willy Boy in London. Emperor, said I, about the partition of China. Well, what of the partition of China? Is it to be partitioned? The emperor's eye twinkled. We have not yet read the morning papers, princess, he said. But we judge from what we saw in the society news of last night's Fliegende Choinal that there will be a military ball at Peking shortly, and that the affair will end brilliantly with a, a, a German. Good, said I. And you will really fight England? Why not? Said he, with a smile at the looking-glass. Your grandmother? I queried, with a slight shake of my head, in deprecation of a family row. She calls us Billy, he cried passionately. Grandmothers can do a great many things, princess, but no grandmother that heaven ever sent into this world shall call us Billy with impunity. I was silent for a moment. Still, Emperor, I said at last, England has been very good to you. She has furnished you with all the coal your ships needed to steam into Chinese waters. Surely that was the act of a grandmother. You wouldn't fight her after that. We will, if she'll lend us ammunition for our guns, said the Emperor gloomily. If she won't do that, then of course there will be no war. But, Princess, let us talk of other things. Have you heard our latest musical composition? I frankly confessed that I had not, and the imperial band was called upon and ordered to play the emperor's new march. It was very moving, and made me somewhat homesick. 
for after all with all due respect to william's originality it was nothing more than a slightly prussianized rendering of all coons look alike to me however i praised the work and added that i had heard nothing like it in wagner which seemed to please the emperor very much i have since heard that as a composer he resents wagner and attributes the success of the latter merely to that accident of birth which brought the composer into the world a half century before william had his chance and now princess he observed as the music ceased your audience is over we are to have our portrait painted at midday and the hour has come assure your people of our undying regard you may kiss our little finger and will not your majesty honor me with his autograph i asked holding out my book after i had kissed his little finger with pleasure said he taking the book and complying with my request as follows faithfully your warlord and master me wasn't it characteristic end of chapter three Chapter Four of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four, Mr. Alfred Austin. Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Hand. Mr. Alfred Austin, read by Nemo. It was on a beautiful March afternoon that I sought out the Poet Laureate of England in his official sanctum in London. A splendid mantle of fog hung over the street, shutting out the otherwise all-too-commercial aspect of that honored byway. It was midday to the stroke of the hour, and a soft, mellow glare suffused the perspective in either direction, proceeding from the gas lamps upon the street corners, which, like the fires of eternal youth, are kept constantly burning in the capital city of the Guelphs. I approached the lair of England's first poet with a beating heart, the trip hammer-like thudding of which against my ribs could be heard like the pounding of the twin screws of an Atlantic liner far down beneath the folds of my Mackintosh. To stand in the presence of Tennyson's successor was an ambition to wish to gratify, but it was awesome, and not a little difficult for the nervous system. However, once committed to the enterprise, I was not to be baffled, and with shaking knees and tremulous hand I banged the brazen knocker against the door until the hall within echoed and re-echoed with its clangor. Immediately a window on the top story was opened, and the laureate himself thrust his head out. I could dimly perceive the contour of his noble forehead through the mist. "'Who's there? Who's there? I fain would know. Are you some dull and dunning dog?' are you a friend or eke a foe i cannot see you through the fog said he i am an american lady journalist i cried up to him making a megaphone of my two hands so that he might not miss a word and i have come to offer you seven dollars a word for a glimpse of you at home how much is that in pounds shillings and pence he asked eagerly one pound eight said i i'll be down he replied instantly, and drawing his noble brow in out of the wet, he slammed the window to, and, if the squeaking sounds I heard within meant anything, slid down the banisters in order not to keep me waiting longer than was necessary. He opened the door, and in a moment we stood face to face. "'Mr. Alfred Austin,' said I. "'The same, O oh lady journalist. I'm glad to take you by the fist, particularly since I've heard you offer one pun eight per word said he cordially grasping me by the hand come right up and make yourself perfectly at home and i'll give you an imitation of my daily routine and will answer whatever questions you may see fit to ask of course you must be aware that i am averse to this sort of thing generally the true poet cannot permit the searchlight of publicity to be turned upon his home without losing something of that delicate hold on mr austin said i i don't wish to be rude but i am not authorized to pay you seven dollars apiece for such words as these you are uttering if you have any explanations to offer the public for condescending to let me peep at you while you work you must do it at your own expense a shade of disappointment passed over his delicate features there's a hundred guineas gone at a stroke he muttered and for an instant I feared that I was to receive my cognier. 
By a strong effort of the will, however, the laureate pulled himself together. If that's the case, so oh Yankee fair, suppose we hasten up the stair, where every day the muses call, and waste no words here in the hall, said he, and then he added courteously, I'm sorry the elevator isn't running. It's one of these English elevators, you know. Indeed, said I, and what's the peculiarity of an English elevator? Like Britons neath the foeman's serried guns, the British elevator never runs, for like the brain of the Scottish thane, the thane, you know, of Cawdor, our lifts are always out of order, he explained. It's very annoying, too, particularly when you have to carry poems up and down stairs. You should let your poems do their own walking, Mr. Austin, said I. I beg your pardon, said he. But how can they? Those I've seen have had enough feet for a centipede, said I, as dryly as I could, considering that I was still dripping with fog. The laureate scratched his head solemnly. Quite so, he said at length. But come, let us hasten. We hastened upward, and five minutes later we were in the sanctum. It was a charming room. A complete set of the British poets stood ranged in chronological sequence on the table. A copy of Hood's Rhymster, well-thumbed, lay open on the sofa, and a volume of popular quotations lay on the floor beside the poet's easy chair. A full-length portrait of Her Majesty the Queen, seven inches high and sixteen wide, hung over a fireplace, and beneath it stood a charming bust of the late Lord Tennyson, with the face turned towards the wall. "'A beautiful workshop,' said I. "'Surely one sees now the sources of your inspiration.' "'Tis true, my dear. "'Tis very, very true. "'Here in my sanctum, high above the pave, ma'am, "'I can't help doing all the things I do. "'Not e'en my great immortal soul to save, ma'am. "'You see, a man who daily has to write "'of things of which Calliope doth side-talk "'must get above the earth and leave the white "'who dully plods along the sidewalk.' "'He answered, that's why I live under the roof instead of hiring chambers on the ground floor. Up here, I am not bothered by what in one of my new poems I shall call mundane things. Rather good expression that, don't you think? The first draft reads, Mundane things, mundane things, Handsome cabs and finger rings, Drossy glitter and glittering dross, May I never come across merely mundane, mundane things. Rather clever to be tossed off on a scratch pad while taking a shower bath, eh? Yes, said I. What suggested it? The merest accident. I got some soap in my eye and was about to give way to my temper when I thought to myself that the true poet ought to rise above petty annoyances of that nature. In other words, above mundane things. Wonderfully interesting, I put in. Was your appointment a surprise to you, Mr. Austin? Surprise? Nay, nay, my lovely maid. Pray, why should I surprise it be? Despite that fortune's but a fickle jade, I knew the thing must come to me. For in these days commercial, don't you see? From eyes like mine, no things can e'er be hid. And when they advertise for poetry, Twas I put in the very lowest bid. He replied, You see, as a newspaper man, I knew what rates the other poets were getting. There was Swinburne getting seven bob a line, And Sir Edwin Arnold asking a guinea a yard, And old Kipling grinding it out for one in six per quatrain and Watson, doing sonnets on the yellow north, and the red, white, and blue east, and the pink southwest, at five pounds a dozen. So when Salisbury rang me up on the phone and said, I'd better put in a bid for the verse contract, I knew just how to arrange my rates to get the work. You had a great advantage over the others, said I. Which shows the value of a newspaper training. Newspaper men know everything, he said. I had but one fear, 
and that was your american poets they're hustlers and i didn't know but that some enterprising american like russell sage or barnum and bailey would form a syndicate and corner america's poem supply and bowl my wickets from under me working together they could have done it but they didn't know their power thank heaven if i may borrow an americanism well mr austin i said rising i am afraid i shall have to go i fear your words have already exceeded the appropriation ah how much do i owe you the laureate took from beneath his chin a small golden object that looked like a locket opening it he scanned it closely for a moment my chinometer says nine hundred and sixty-three words let's call it a thousand i don't care for trifles said he very well i replied that is seven thousand dollars i owe you yes he said but of course i allow you the usual discount for what said i cash said he pool does it on clothes and i've adopted the system it pays in the end for as i say in my next ode to the queen to be written on the occasion of a ruby jubilee a sovereign in hand is worth two heirs presumptive in the bush in other words cash deferred maketh the heart sick precisely i'll put that motto down in my notebook for future use i thank you for the compliment i said as i paid him five thousand nine hundred fifty dollars good-bye mr austin good-bye miss witherup said he any time when you find you have a half hour and a thousand pounds to spare come again say au revoir but not good-bye for why there is no cause to whisper veil when we can parley without a fear that words are cheap my dear said he ushering me downstairs and bowing me out into the fog which by this time had lightened so that i could see the end of my nose as i walked along end of chapter four chapter five of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter five andrew lang anne warrington witherup read by k hand miss phipps phipps read by phone several days after the exhilarating interview with the poet laureate of england i was honored by a dinner given to me by the honorable company of lady copymongers at their guild hall in piccadilly circus southwest it was a delightful affair and i met many ladies of prominence in literary fields miss braddon and john oliver hobbs were there and one rather stout old lady of regal manner who was introduced as clara gelf but whom i strongly suspected to be none other than the authoress of that famous and justly popular work leaves from my diary in the highlands or sixty years a potentate she was very gracious to me and promised to send me an autograph copy of her publisher's circular most interesting of all the persons encountered at the banquet however was miss philippa phipps phipps forewoman of the andrew lang manuscript manufacturing company from whom i gained much startling information which i am certain will interest the public in the course of our conversation i observed to miss phipps phipps of whom i had never heard before that nothing in modern letters so amazed me as the output of andrew lang for both its quality and its quantity the lady flushed pleasurably and said modestly we try to keep up to the standard miss witherup as a worker in literary fields you perhaps realize how hard it is to do this but of one thing i assure you we have never in the last ten years allowed a bit of scamp work of any description to go out of our factory of course we have grades of work but the lower grades do not go out with the lang mark upon them i looked at miss phipps phipps in a puzzled way for the full import of her words did not dawn upon me instantly i don't quite understand said i we who are we the lang manuscript manufacturing company explained the young woman you are aware of course that andrew lang is not an individual but a corporation i certainly never dreamed it said i with a half smile how could it be otherwise asked miss phipps phipps 
no human being could alone turn out an average of 647 million words a year, Miss Witherup, not even if he could run two typewriters at once, and write with his feet while dictating to a stenographer. It would be a physical impossibility. Dear me! I cried in amazement. I know that there were thousands of articles from Lang every year, but 647 million words? Why, it is incredible! That is only the average, you know said Miss Phipps Phipps proudly. In good years we have run as high as seven hundred and sixteen million and three hundred and forty-six words, and this year, if all goes well and our operatives do not strike, we expect to turn out over eight hundred million. We have signed contracts to deliver one hundred and eleven million three hundred eighty-three thousand words in the month of June alone, mostly Christmas stuff, you know, to be published next November. Last month we turned out thirty-nine thousand lines of poetry a day for twenty-five working days, and our essay mill has been running overtime for sixteen weeks. Well, I am surprised, said I. Yet when I come to think of it, there is no reason why I should be. This is an age of corporations. Precisely, said Miss Phipps Phipps. Furthermore, ours had a philanthropic motive at the bottom of it all. Here was Mr. Lang simply killing himself with work, and some seven hundred young men and women of an aspiring turn of mind absolutely out of employment. The burdens of one, we believed, could be made to relieve the necessities of the other, and we made a proposition to Mr. Lang to make himself over to us, promising to fill his contracts and relieve him of the necessity of doing any further literary work for the rest of his life. We incorporated him on a basis of two million pounds, giving him one million pounds in shares. The rest was advertised as for sale, and was oversubscribed ten to one. Workshops were built at Woking, and as a starter six hundred operatives were employed. Working night and day, at the end of the first year, we were just three months behind our orders. We immediately doubled our force to 1,200, and so it has gone until today, and the business is constantly increasing. Our stock is at a premium of 117%, and we keep 3,750 people, with a capacity of 10,000 words a day each, constantly employed. I am astonished, I cried. The magnitude of the work is appalling. Are your shops open to visitors? Certainly. I shall be pleased if you will come out to Woking tomorrow, and I will show you over the establishment, replied Miss Phipps Phipps courteously, and then for the moment the conversation stopped. The next day I was at Woking, where Miss Phipps Phipps met me at the station. A ten-minute's drive brought us to the factory, a detailed description of which would be impossible in the limits at my disposal suffice it to say that after an hour's walk through the various departments i was still not half acquainted with the marvels of the establishment in the essay and letters to dead authors department sixty-eight girls were driving their pens at a rate that made my head whirl a whole floor was given over to the fairy tale department and i saw fairy books of all the colors in the rainbow being turned out at a rapid rate here said the forelady as we reached a large capacious and well-lighted writing-room is our latest venture. There are seven hundred employees in here, and they work from nine a.m. to twelve, have a half hour for luncheon, and resume. At five they go home. They have in hand the Lang Meredith. We have purchased from Mr. Meredith all right and title to his complete works, which we are having rewritten. These will appear at the proper times as The Lucid Meredith by Andrew Lang. The old gentleman at the desk over there, she added, pointing to a keen-eyed, sharp-visaged fellow, with a long nose and nervous manner. "'Is Mr. Fergus Holmes, who began life as a detective and became a critic. He is here on a large salary, and has nothing to do but use his critical insight and detective instinct to find the thought in some of Mr. Meredith's most complicated periods. After all, Miss Witherup, our operators are only human, and some of them cannot understand Meredith as well as they might.' "'I am glad to know,' said I, with a laugh, "'that you pay Mr. Fergus Holmes a large salary, "'a man employed to detect the thought of some of Mr. Meredith's paragraphs.' "'Oh, we understand all about that.' Miss Phipps Phipps smiled in return. "'We know his value, which is very great in this particular matter.' "'And does he never fail?' I asked. "'I presume he does, but he never gives up. "'Once he asked to be allowed to consult with Mr. Meredith "'before giving an opinion, and we consented.' He wrote to the author, and it turned out that Mr. Meredith had forgotten the paragraph entirely, and couldn't tell himself what he meant. But he was very nice about it. He gave us carte blanche to make it mean anything that would fit into the rest of the story. We passed on into another room. This room, said Miss Phipps Phipps, is at present devoted to the British poets. 
there have been a great many bad poets in Britain who have become immortal, and we are trying to make them good. That young man over there with the red hair is rewriting Burns, the introduction we are doing in our essay room. The young lady in blue glasses is doing gay over again, and we have entrusted our lang edition of Herrick to the retired clergyman whom you see sitting on that settee by the window with a slate on his lap. To show you how completely we do our work, let me tell you that in this case of Herrick, all his poems were first copied off on slates by our ordinary copyists, so that the clergyman who is doing them over again has only to wet his finger to rub out what might strike some people as an immortal line. It's a splendid idea, I cried. But would the blackboard prove less expensive? We never consider expense, said Miss Phipps Phipps. We really do not have to. You see, with a capacity of 800 million words a year at the rates for Lang, for which you pay at rates for the unknown, we are left with a margin of profit which pleases our stockholders and does not arouse the cupidity of other authors. What a wonderful system, said I. We think it's so, said Miss Phipps Phipps placidly. And do you never have any troubles? I asked. Oh, yes, replied my hostess. Only last week the grass of Parnassus and blue ballot employees rose up and struck for six pence more per quatrain. We blocked them out, and today I filled their places with equally competent employees. You can always find plenty of unemployed and unpublished poets ready to step in. Our prose hands do not give us much trouble, and our revisers never say a word. Have you any novelties in hand? I asked. Oh, yes, said Miss Phipps Phipps. We are going to supersede Boswell with Lang's Johnson. We are preparing a Lang Shakespeare, and when the copyrights on Thackeray and Dickens have expired, we'll do them all over again. Then we are experimenting in colours for a new fairy book, and our chromatic bibles will be a great thing. We are also contemplating an offer to the French Academy to permit all the works of its members to be issued as ours. I really think that Daudet by Andrew Lang would pay. Hugo by Lang might prove too much for the British public, but we shall do it, because we have confidence in ourselves. We shall issue the Philosophy of Schopenhauer by Andrew Lang next week. How about our American authors? I queried. Are you going to rewrite any of them? Who are they? asked Miss Phipps Phipps, with an admirable expression of ingenuousness. Well, said I, myself, and, uh, Edgar Poe. Any poets? said Miss Phipps Phipps. Some, I answered, myself and, uh, Longfellow. I don't know, said Miss Phipps Phipps, becoming somewhat reserved. Send me your manuscripts. I've heard a few, of course, but, uh, uh, who is Miss Longfellow? I contented myself with a reference to the scenery, and then I said, Miss Double Phipps, I wish you would conduct me into the presence of Mr. Lang. I like him as a manly man, and I love him for the books he has put forth, which not only show his manliness, but his appreciation of everything in letters that is good. Well, really, Miss Vidrup, said Miss Phipps Phipps, we don't know where he is, but we think, it is not my thought, but that of the corporation, we think you will find him playing golf at St. Andrews. Thank you, said I. But after all, I added, is it not what the corporation thinks so much as what you as an individual think? Where do you believe I may find Mr. Lang? Among the immortals, was the answer, spoken with enthusiasm. And believing that the lady was right, I ceased to look for Mr. Lang, for in the presence of immortals I always feel myself to be foolish. Nevertheless, I am very glad to have seen the Lang Company at Woking, and I now understand many things that I never understood before. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Witherup by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Zola Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Hand. Zola, read by phone. Hussar, read by Nemo. To visit a series of foreign celebrities at home without including Emile Zola in the list would be very like refusing to listen to the lines of Hamlet in Bacon's immortal tragedy of that name. Furthermore, to call upon the justly famous novelist presupposes a visit to Paris, which is a delightful thing, even for a lady journalist. 
Hence it was that on leaving Woking, after my charming little glimpse into the home life of the Lang Manuscript Manufacturing Company, I decided to take a run across the channel and look up the Frenchman of the hour. The diversion had about it an air of adventure which made it pleasantly exciting. For ten hours after my arrival at Paris, I did not dare ask where the novelist lived, for fear that I might be arrested and sent to Devil's Island with Captain Dreyfus, or forced to languish for a year or two at the Chateau d'Elf near Marseilles, until the government could get a chance formally to inquire why I wished to know the abiding place of Monsieur Zola. There was added to this also some apprehension that even if I escaped the gendarmes, the people themselves might rise up and string me to a lamp-post as a suitable answer to so treasonable a question. To tell the truth, I did not go about my business with my usual nerve and aplomb. Had I represented only myself, I should not have hesitated to expose myself to any or to all danger. Entrusted as I was, however, with a commission of great importance to those whom I serve at home, it was my duty to proceed cautiously and save my life. I therefore went at the matter diplomatically. For fifty centimes I induced a small flower girl, whom I encountered in front of the Café de la Pas, to inquire of the head waiter of that establishment where Monsieur Zola could be met. The tragedy that ensued was terrible. What became of the child I do not know, but when, three hours later, the troops cleared the square in front of the café, the dead and wounded amounted to between two hundred and fifty and three hundred, and the china, tables, and interior decorations of the café were strewn down the Avenue de la Opera, as far as the Rue de la Chelle, and along the boulevard to the Madeleine. The upper house itself was not appreciably damaged, although I am told that pieces of steak and chops and canned peas have since been found clinging to the third-story windows of its splendid façade. My next effort was even more cautious. I bought a plain sheet of notepaper and addressed it anonymously to the editor of La Patrie, asking for the desired information. The next morning La Patrie announced that if I would send my name and address to its office, the communication would be answered suitably. My caution was still great, however, and the name and address I gave were those of a Blanchon Suisse, who ran a pretty little shop on Rue Rivoli. That night the poor woman was exiled from France, and the block in which she transacted business demolished by a mob of ten thousand. I was about to give up, when chance favored me. The next evening, while seated in my box at the opera, the door was suddenly opened, and a heavy but rather handsome-eyed brunette of, I should say, fifty years of age, burst in upon me. Mon Dieu! she cried as i turned save me tell them i am your chaperon your mother your sister anything only save me you will never regret it she had hardly uttered these words when a sharp rap came upon the door entrez i cried que voulez-vous messieurs i added with some asperity as five hussars entered their swords clanking ominously your name said one who appeared to be their leader "'Anne Warrington Witherup, if you refer to me,' said I, drawing myself up proudly. "'If you refer to this lady,' I added, "'she is Mrs. Watkins Wilbur Witherup, my, uh, my stepmother. "'We are Americans, and I am a lady journalist.' "'Fortunately, my remarks were made in French, "'and my French was of a kind which was convincing proof "'that I came from Westchester County. "'A great change came over the intruders.' "'Pardon, mademoiselle,' said the leader, "'with an apologetic bow to myself.' We have made the grand faux pas. We have entered the wrong box. And may I know the cause of your unwarranted intrusion, I demanded, without referring the question to the State Department at home? We sought. We sought an enemy to France, mademoiselle, said they. We sought the ended air. I harbor only the friends of France, said I. Vive la Witherup! cried the hussars, taking the observation as a compliment, and then chucking me under the chin and again apologizing, with a sweeping bow to my newly acquired stepmother, they withdrew. "'Well, mamma," I said, turning to the lady at my side, "'perhaps you can shed some light on this mystery. Who are you?' "'Softly, if you value your life,' came the answer. "'Zola, c'est moi.' "'Mon Dieu,' said I. "'Vous? Bien, bien, bien.' "'Speak in English,' he whispered. Then I can understand. Oh, I only said, well, 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 I explained. And you have adopted this disguise? Because I have resolved to live long enough to get into the academy, he explained. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your timely aid. 
if they had caught me they would have thrown me down into the midst of the gluck come said i rising and taking him by the hand i have come to paris to see you at home it was my only purpose i will escort you thither no no he cried never again i am much more at home here my dear lady much more pray sit down why when i left home by a subterranean passage perhaps you are not aware over a thousand members of the national guard were singing the marseillaise on the front piazza three thousand men were dancing that shocking dance the cancan in my back yard and four regiments of volunteers were looking for something to eat in the kitchen assisted by one hundred and fifty petroleurs to do their cooking all my bedroom furniture was thrown out of the second-story windows and the manuscripts of my new novel were being cut up into souvenirs poor old mamma i said taking him by the hand you can always find comfort in the thought that you have done a noble action it was a pretty good scheme replied zola a million pounds sterling paid to your best advertising mediums couldn't have brought in a quarter the same amount of fame or notoriety and then you see it places me on par with hugo who was exiled that's really what i wanted miss viserup hugo was a poseur however and if he hadn't had the kick to be born before me ah said i interrupting for i have rather liked hugo and where do you wish to go to america he replied dramatically to america it is the only country in the world where realism is not artificial you are a simple unaffected outspoken people who can hate without hating can love without marrying can fight without fighting i love you sir or rather mamma said i somewhat indignantly for as a married man zola had no right to make a declaration like that even if he is a frenchman not you as you he hastened to say but you as an america i love ah who is your best publisher miss viserup i shall not tell you what i told zola but they may get his next book monsieur zola said i placing great emphasis on the monsieur tell me what interested you in dreyfus humanity or literature both he replied they are the same literature that is not humanity is not literature humanity that does not provide literary people with opportunity is not broad humanity but special and selfish and therefore is not humanity at all did dreyfus write to you i asked no said he nor i to him i have no time to write letters then how did it all come about i demanded he was attracting too much attention cried the novelist passionately he was living tragedy while i was only writing it people said his story was greater than any i emile wither up said i anxiously for it seemed to me that the people in the next box were listening merci said he yes i mrs watkins wilbur viserup of westchester city u s a was told that this man's story was greater and deeper in its tragic significance than any i could conceive wherefore i wrote to the war department and accused it of concealing the truth from france in the mere interests of policy of diplomacy i made them tremble i made the army shiver i have struck a blow at the republic from which i will not soon recover and today dreyfus pales beside the significance of zola i believe in free institution but heaven help a free institution when it clashes with a being of corporation like emile with rap do be cautious i put in again yet sir i added they have quashed your sentence and you need not go to jail no said he gloomily i need not why because jail is safer than home that is why they did it they dare not exile me they hope by crushing me to be rid of me but they will see i will force them to imprison me yet if you are so anxious to visit america why don't you i suggested there is no duty on the kind of things we do not wish to manufacture ourselves ah said he if i was exiled they would send me if i go as a private citizen well i pay my own way oh said i i see 
and then as the opera was over we departed zola saw me to my carriage and just as i entered it he said excuse me miss Viserup, but what paper do you write for i told him it is a splendid journal he cried i take it every day and especially enjoy its sunday edition in fact it is the only american newspaper i read tell your editor this and here is my photograph and my autograph and a page of my manuscript for reproduction he took all these things out of his basque as he spoke i will send you to-morrow he added an original sketch in black and white of my house with the receipt of my favorite dish together with a recommendation of a nerve tonic that i use with this will go a complete set of my works with a few press notices of the same and the prices they bring on all bookstands good-bye god bless you he concluded huskily i shall miss my stepdaughter as i would an only son adieu we parted and i returned much affected to my rooms while he went back i presume to his mob-ridden home End of chapter 6chapter 7 of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of ann warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 7 sir henry irving Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Han. Henry Irving, read by Ellis. Property Man, read by Phone. The impression left upon my mind by my curious and intensely dramatic encounter with Zola was of so theatric a nature that I resolved to get back to conventional ground once more through the medium of the stage. I was keyed up to a high pitch of nervous excitement by my unexpected meeting with an unexpected stepmother, and the easiest return to my norm of equanimity, it seemed to me, lay through the doors of the green room. Hence I sought out London's only actor, Sir Henry Irving. I found him a most agreeable gentleman. He received me cordially on the stage of his famous theatre. There was no setting of any kind. All about us were the bare, cold walls of the empty stage, and it was difficult to believe that this very same spot, the night before, had been the scene of brilliant revels. "'How do you do, Miss Witherup?' said Sir Henry, as I arrived, advancing with his peculiar stride, which reminds me of dear old Dobbin on my father's farm. "'It is a great pleasure to welcome to England so fair a representative of so fine a press.' i wished to see you at home sir henry i replied not desiring to let him see how completely his cordiality had won me and so affecting a coldness i was far from feeling that is why i have you here madame he replied the stage is my home the boards for me the flare of the limelights the pit the sweet family circle the auditorium in the dim distance the footlights ah these are the inspiring influences of my life the old song home is where the heart is must in my case be revised to favour the box office and instead of the old oaken bucket the song i sing is the song of the old trap-door did you ever hear that beautiful poem the song of the old trap-door no sir henry i never did i said i hope to however i will do it now for you he said and assisting me over the footlights into a box he took the centre of the stage ordered the calcium turned upon him and began how dear to my heart are the scenes of my triumphs in hamlet othello and shylock as well completely confounding the critics who cry humps and casting o'er others a magical spell how dear to my soul are the fond recollections of thunderous clappings and stampings and roars as bowing and scraping in many directions i sink out of sight through the old trap doors the old trap doors the bold trap doors that creaking and squeaking sink down through the floors i could not restrain my enthusiasm when he had finished bravo i cried clapping my hands together until my palms ached more there is no more said sir henry with a gratified smile 
you see recited before ten or twenty thousand people with the same verve that i put into eugene aram or ten little nigger boys so much enthusiasm is aroused that i cannot go on the applause never stops so of course a second verse would be a mere waste of material quite so i observed then a thought came to me which i resolved to turn to my prophet sir henry i said i'll bet a box of cigars against a box for your performance to-night that i can guess who wrote that poem for you in one guess done he replied eagerly austin said i make miss witherup out a ticket for box a for the merchant of venice to-night cried the famous actor to his secretary how the deuce did you know oh that was easy i replied much gratified at having won my wager i don't believe any one else could have thought of a rhyme to triumphs like cry humps you have wonderful insight remarked sir henry but come miss witherup i did not mean to receive you in a box or on a bare stage what is your favourite style of interior decoration his question puzzled me i did not know but that possibly sir henry's words were a delicate method of suggesting luncheon and then it occurred to me that this could not possibly be so at that hour one o'clock actors never eat at hours which seem regular to others i hazarded an answer however and all was made clear at once i have a leaning toward the empire style said i sir henry turned immediately and roared up into the drops hi billy set the third act of sans jean and tell my valet to get out my bonapartes the lady has a leaning towards the empire excuse me for one moment miss witherup he added turning to me if you will remain where you are until i have the room ready for you i will join you there in five minutes the curtain was immediately lowered and i sat quietly in the box as requested wondering greatly what was going to happen five minutes later the curtain rose again and there where all had been bare and cheerless i saw the brilliantly lit room wherein bonaparte as emperor has his interview with his ex laundress it was cosy comfortable and perfect in every detail and while i was admiring who should appear at the rear entrance but bonaparte himself or rather sir henry made up as bonaparte dear me sir henry i cried delightedly you do me too much honour that were impossible he replied gallantly still lest you be embarrassed by such preparation to receive you let me say that this is my invariable custom and when i know in advance of the taste of my callers all is ready when they arrive unfortunately i have had to keep you waiting because i did not know your tastes do you mean to say that you adapt your scenery and personal makeup to the likings of the individual who calls i cried amazed always said he it is easy and i think courteous for instance when the archbishop of canterbury calls upon me i have canterbury cathedral set here and wear vestments and receive him in truly ecclesiastical style the organ is kept going and lines of choir boys suitably garbed pass constantly in and out when the king of denmark called i had the throne room scene of hamlet set and we taught with his majesty sitting on the throne and myself clad as the melancholy prince reclining on a rug before him he expressed himself as being vastly entertained it gave him pleasure and was no trouble to me beyond giving orders to the stage manager then when an old boyhood friend of mine who had gone wrong came to see me hearing that he was an inebriate as well as a thief i received him in the character of dubos in the attic scene of the lion's mail a very interesting plan said i and one which i should think would be much appreciated by all true replied sir henry and then he laughed it never failed but once said he and then it wasn't my fault old beer bomb tree came to visit me one morning and i had the graveyard scene of hamlet set but myself appeared as the crushed tragedian i thought tree had some sense of humour and could appreciate the joke but i was mistaken he got as mad as a hatter and started away in a rage if he hadn't fallen into the grave on the way out i'd never have had a chance to explain that i didn't mean anything by it 
By this time I had clambered back to the stage again, and was about to sit down on one of the very handsome empire sofas in the room, when Sir Henry gave a leap of at least two feet in the air, and roared with rage. "'Send the property man here,' he cried, trembling all over and turning white in the face. "'Send him here. Bring him in chains. If he's upstairs, throw him down. If he's downstairs, put him in a catapult and throw him up. It matters not how he comes.' as long as he comes i shrank back in terror the man's rage seemed almost ungovernable and i observed that he held a poker in his hand up and down the room he strode muttering imprecations upon the property man until i felt that if i did not wish to see murder done i would better withdraw excuse me sir henry i said rising and speaking timidly i think perhaps i better go sit down he retorted imperiously pointing at the sofa with the poker i sat down and just then the property man arrived want me serenary he said irving gazed at him with a terrible frown wrinkling his forehead for a full minute during which it seemed to me that the whole building trembled and i could almost hear the seats in the top gallery creak with nervousness want you he retorted witheringly yes i want you as an usher perhaps as a flunkey to announce that a carriage waits as a roman citizen to say hi hi but as a property man never there was another ominous pause and i could see that the sarcasm of the master sank deeply into the soul of the hireling what what have i done serenary asked the trembling property man what have you done roared sir henry look upon that poker and see the man looked and sank sobbing to the floor heaven help me he moaned i have a sick grandfather serenary he added i was up with him all night the great man immediately became all tenderness throwing the poker to one side he sprang to where his unfortunate property man lay and raised him up why the devil didn't you say so he said sympathetically i didn't know it henderson my dear old boy never mind the poker let it go i forgive you that here take this twenty pound note and don't come back until your grandfather is well again it was a beautiful scene and so pathetic that i almost wept the property man rose to his feet and putting the twenty pound note in his pocket walked dejectedly away sir henry turned to me and said his voice husky with emotion pardon me miss withrop i was provoked it was a magnificent scene sir henry said i but what was the matter with the poker i thought it rather a good one it is he said sitting down on a small chair and twiddling his thumbs but you see this is an empire scene and that confounded thing is a marie antoinette poker why if that had happened at a public performance i should have been ruined might not bonaparte have used a marie antoinette poker i asked to draw him out bonaparte miss witherup he answered might have done anything but that you see by the time he became emperor every bit of household stuff in the palace had been stolen by the french mobs therefore it is fair to assume that the palace was entirely refurnished when bonaparte came in and as at that time there was no craze for louis quinn's or louis c's or louis number this that and the other it is not at all probable that napoleon would have taken the trouble to snoop around the second-hand shops for a poker of that kind indeed it is more than probable that everything he had in the palace was absolutely new what a wonderful mind you must have sir henry to think of these things i said enthusiastically miss witherup said the actor knight impressively this is an age of wonderful minds and there are so many of them that he who wishes to rise above his fellows must be careful of every detail would i have been a knight to-day had it not been for my care of details never it would have gone to willie edwin or to my friend tree or to some other actor of the same grade my principle miss witherup is not original i look after the details and the results take care of themselves it is the old proverb of the pennies and the pounds all over again it is wisdom i said oracularly but it must be wearing oh no 
said sir henry with a gesture of self-deprecation there are so many details that i had to make up a staff of advisers as a matter of fact i am not a man i am a combination of men in the popular mind i embody the wisdom the taste the culture the learning of many in fact miss witherup while i am not london london finds artistic expression in me and you are coming to america again i asked rising for i felt i ought to go i was so awed by the humble confession of my host some day said he when times are better why sir henry i cried you who have just given twenty pounds to your property man can surely afford to cross i referred madame he interrupted to times in america for i contemplate charging five dollars a stall when next i visit you you see my next visit will be the first of a series of twenty farewell seasons which i propose to make in the states which i love dearly don't forget that please which i love dearly i want your people to know i shall not sir henry said i holding out my hand good-bye say au revoir he replied i shall surely see you at to-night's performance and so we parted on the way down to the strand back to my rooms i met the property man who was evidently waiting for me excuse me miss said he but you saw saw what said i how he called me down about the mary infinite poker he replied nervously yes said i i did well it was all arranged beforehand miss so that you would be impressed by his love for and careful attention to details that's all said he we other fellers that till i see him has some pride miss and we want you to understand that serenary isn't the only genius on the program by good long odds it's not knowing that that made her majesty the queen make her mistake i didn't know mr henderson that her majesty had made a mistake i said coldly well she did miss she knighted serenary as an individual when she ought to have knighted a whole bloomin theatre there's others than him as does it he observed proudly king somebody knighted a piece of steak why couldn't the queen knight the theatre which struck me as an idea of some force although i am a great admirer of a man who like sir henry can dominate an institution of such manifest excellence end of chapter seven chapter eight of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 8 ian mclaren ann warrington witherup read by k hand ian mclaren read by ellis young women read by lian yao so pleased was i with my experience at the lyceum theatre that fearing to offset the effects upon my nerves of sir henry irving's wonderful cordiality i made no more visits to the home of celebrities for two weeks unless a short call on li huang chang can be considered such mr chang was so dispirited over the loss of his yellow jacket and the partition of the chinese empire that i could not get a word out of him except that he was not feeling welly well and that is hardly sufficient to base an interview on for a practically inexperienced lady journalist like myself therefore i returned to english fields again for my next interview and having heard that the reverend ian mclaren was engaged on a translation into english of his scottish stories i took a train to liverpool first having wired the famous object of my visit of my intention he replied instantly by telegraph that he was too busy to receive me but i started along just the same there is nothing in the world that so upsets me as having one of my plans go awry and i certainly do not intend to have my equanimity disturbed for the insufficient reason that somebody else is busy so i wired back to liverpool as follows very sorry but did not receive your telegram until too late to change my plans my trunks were all packed and my scotch lassie costume finished expect me on the eleven sixty seven will not stay more than a week signed anne warrington witherup dr mclaren being a courteous man and i being a lady i felt confident that this would fetch him and it apparently did for two hours later i received this message wither up london i'm not here have gone to edinburgh do not know when i will return signed mclaren 
To this I immediately replied, McLaren, Liverpool. All right, we'll meet you at Edinburgh as requested. Signed, Witherup. The reader will observe that it takes a smart British author to escape from an American lady journalist once she has set her heart on interviewing him. But I did not go to Edinburgh. I am young and have not celebrated my thirtieth birthday more than five times, but I am not a gudgeon, so I refuse to be caught by the Edinburgh subterfuge and stuck to my original proposition of going to Liverpool on the eleven sixty seven. And, what is more, I wore my Highland costume and all the way down studied a Scotch glossary until I knew the difference between such words as dower and hoots as well as if I had been born and bred at Loch McGlosky. As I had expected, Dr. McLaren was there, anxiously awaiting developments, and as I stepped out of my carriage, he jumped from behind a huge trunk by which he thought he was concealed, and fled through the Northwestern Hotel out into the street, and thence off in the direction of the Alexandra docks. I followed in hot pursuit, and, by the aid of a handy hansom, was not long in overtaking the unwilling author. It may be said by some that I was rather too persistent, and knowing that the good doctor did not wish to be interviewed, should have relinquished my quest. It was just that quality in Dr. McLaren's make-up that made me persist. There are so few successful authors who may be said to possess the virtue of modesty in the presence of an interviewer that I determined to catch one who was indeed the only one of that rare class I had ever met. Dr. McLaren, I cried as I leaped out of the hansom and landed, fortunately, on my feet. A lady journalist is a good deal of a feline in certain respects, directly in his path. The same, he replied pantingly. And you are Miss Witherup? The very same, I retorted coldly. I am perfectly delighted to see you, he said, removing his hat and mopping his brow, which the unwanted exercise he was taking had caused to drip profusely. Perfectly charmed, Miss Witherup. I eyed him narrowly. One wouldn't have thought so, I said, with a suspicious emphasis, from the way you were running away from me. Running away? My dear Miss Witherup? He gasped, with an admirable affectation of innocence. Why, not at all. Then why, Dr. McLaren, I asked, were you running towards the docks within ten seconds of the arrival of my train? To the gentleman's credit, to be it said that he never hesitated for a moment. Why? He cried in the manner of one cut to the heart by an unjust suspicion. Why? Because, madame... When you get out of that railway carriage, I did not see you, and fearing that I had mistaken your message, and that instead of coming from London by rail, you are coming from America by steamer, I hastened off down towards the docks, in the hope of welcoming you to England, and helping you through the custom house. You wrong me, madame, by thinking otherwise. The gentleman's tact was so overwhelmingly fine that I forgave him his fiction, which was not quite convincing, and took him by the hand. And now, said I, may I see you at home? A gloomy cloud settled over the doctor's fine features. That is my embarrassment, he said with a deep sigh. I haven't any. What? I cried. I have been evicted, he said sadly. You? For non-payment of rent? I asked, astonished. Not at all said the doctor, taking a five-pound note from his pocket and throwing it into the street. I have more money than I know what to do with. For heresy, my house belongs to a man who does not like the doctrines of my books, and he put us out last Monday. That is why— I understand, I said, pressing his hand sympathetically. I am so sorry. But cheer up, doctor, I added. I have been sent here by an American newspaper that never does anything by halves. I have been told to interview at home. It must be done. My paper spares no expense. Therefore, when I find you without a home to be interviewed in, I am authorized to provide you with one. Come, let us go and purchase a furnished house somewhere. He looked at me, astonished. Well, he gasped out at length. I've seen something of American enterprise. But this beats everything. I suppose we can get a furnished house for ten thousand dollars, I said. You can rent all Liverpool for that, he said. Suppose, instead of going to that expense, we run over to the golf links. I'm very much at home there, though I don't play much of a game. Its atmosphere is very Scottish, said I. It is indeed, he replied. Indeed, it's too Scotch for me. I can hold my own with a great bulk of Scotch dialect with ease, but when it comes to golf terms, I'm a duffer from Dumfries. 
there are words like foozle and tea off and schlaff and baffy iron and glen livet i had em explained to me many a time and oft but they go out of one ear just as fast they go in at the other that's one reason why i've never written a golf story the game ought to appeal strongly to me for two reasons the self-restraint it imposes upon one's vocabulary profane terms and the large body of clerical persons who have found it adapted to their requirements but the idiom of it floors me and after several ineffectual efforts to master the mysteries of its glossary i gave it up i can strive like a professional and my putting is a dream but i can't converse intelligently about it and i have discovered that half the pleasure of the game lies in talking of it afterwards i have given it up by this time we had reached the railway station again and a great light as of an inspiration lit up the doctor's features splendid idea he cried let us go into the waiting room of the station miss witherup you can interview me there i have just remembered that when i was lecturing in america the great part of my time was passed waiting in railway stations for trains that varied in lateness between two and eight hours and i got to feel at home in them i doubt not that in a few moments i shall feel at home in this one and then you know you need not bother about your train back to london for it leaves from this very spot in twenty minutes he looked at me anxiously but he need not have when i discovered that he could not master the art of golfing sufficiently to be able to talk about it at least he suddenly lost all interest to me i have known so many persons who were actually only half baked who could talk intelligently about golf whether they played well or not the tea-table golfers we call them at my home near weehawken that it seemed to be nothing short of sheer imbecility for a person to confess to an absolute inability to brag about driving like a professional and putting like a dream very well doctor said i this will do me quite well i'm tired and willing to go back anyhow don't bother to wait for my departure oh indeed he cried his face suffusing with pleasure i shall be delighted to see nothing would so charm me as to see you safely off i suppose it was well meant but i couldn't compliment him on his putting are you coming to america again i asked i hope to some day he replied but not to read or to lecture i am coming to see something of your country i wish to write some recollections of it and just now my recollections are confused i know of course that new york city is the heart of the orange district of florida and that albany is the capital of saratoga i am aware that niagara falls is at the junction of the hudson and the missouri and that the Greek lakes are in the Adirondacks and are well stocked with shad, trout, and terrapin. But of your people, I know nothing save that they gather in great audiences and pay large sums for the pleasure of seeing how an author endures reading his own stuff. I know that you all dine publicly always, and that your men live at clubs while the ladies are off bicycling and voting but what becomes of the babies i don't know and i don't wish to be told i leave them in the consideration of my friend kane when i write my book scooting through scholaris or long poles on a pullman i wish it to be the result of personal observation and not of hearsay a very good idea said i and will this be published over your own name no madame he replied that is where we british authors who write about america make a mistake we ruin ourselves if we tell the truth my book will ostensibly be the work of sandy scootman good name said i and a good rhyme as well to what he asked hootmon i said with a certain dryness of manner just then the train bell rang and the london express was ready here doctor said i handing him the usual check as i rose to depart here is a draft on london for five thousand dollars our thanks to go with it for your courtesy he looked annoyed i told you i didn't wish any money said he with some asperity 
i have a more american fifty cent dollars now than i can get rid of they annoy me and he tore the check up we then parted and the train drew out of the station opposite me in the carriage was a young woman who i thought might be interested in knowing with whom i had been talking do you know who that was i asked very well indeed she replied ian mclaren i said not a bit of it said she that's one of our head detectives we know him well in liverpool dr mclaren employs him to stave off american interviewers i stared at the woman aghast i don't believe it i said if he'd been a detective he wouldn't have torn up my check quite so retorted the young woman and there the conversation stopped i wonder if she was right if i thought she was i'd devote the rest of my life to seeing ian mclaren at home but i can't help feeling that she was wrong the man was so entirely courteous after i finally cornered him that i don't see how it could have been anyone else than the one i sought for however much one may object to this popular author's dialect england has sent us nothing finer in the way of a courteous gentleman than he End of chapter eight chapter nine of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter nine rudyard kipling anne warrington witherup read by k hand rudyard kipling read by pavia an endeavor to find rudyard kipling at home is very much like trying to discover the north pole most people have an idea that there is a north pole somewhere but up to the hour of going to press few have managed to locate it definitely the same is true of mr kipling's home he has one no doubt somewhere but exactly where that favored spot is is as yet undetermined my first effort to find him was at his residence in vermont but upon my arrival i learned that he had fled from the green mountain state in order to escape from the autograph hunters who were continually lurking about his estate next i sought him at his lodgings in london but the fog was so thick that if so be he was within i could not find him then taking a p and o steamer i went out to calcutta and thence to simla in neither place was he to be found and i sailed to egypt hired a camel and upon this ship of the desert cruised down the easterly coast of africa to the transvaal where i was informed that while he had been there recently mr kipling had returned to london i immediately turned about and upon my faithful and wobbly steed took a short cut catacorner wise across to algiers where i was fortunate enough to intercept the steamer upon which the object of my quest was sailing back to britain he was travelling incognito as mr peters but i recognized him in a moment not only by his vocabulary but by his close resemblance to a woodcut i had once seen in the advertisement of a famous dermatologist which i had been told was a better portrait of kipling than of dr skinberry himself whose skill in making people look unlike themselves was celebrated by the publication of the woodcut in question he was leaning gracefully over the starboard galley as i walked up the gangplank i did not speak to him however until after the vessel had sailed i am too old a hand at interviewing modest people to be precipitate and i knew that if i began to talk to mr kipling about my mission before we started he would in all probability sneak ashore and wait over a steamer to escape me once started he was doomed unless he should choose to jump overboard so i waited and finally as gibraltar gradually sank below the horizon i tackled him mr kipling said i as we met on the lanyard deck peters said he lighting a gin rishka all the same i retorted taking out my notebook i've come to interview you at home are you a good sailor i'm good at whatever i try said he therefore you can wager a spring bonnet against a cohat that i am a good sailor excuse me for asking said i it was necessary to ascertain my instructions are to interview you at home if you are a good sailor then you are at home on the sea so we may begin what work are you engaged on now the hardest of my life he replied i am now trying to avoid an american lady journalist i know you are an american by the cuban flag you are wearing in your buttonhole i know that you are a lady because you wear a bonnet which a gentleman would not do if he could and i know you're a journalist because you have confessed it but for goodness sake madam address me as peters and i will talk on forever 
if it were known on this boat that i am kipling i should be compelled to write autographs for the balance of the voyage and i have come away for a rest very well mr peters said i i will respect your wishes why did you go to south africa after colour i am writing a new book and i needed colour there are more coloured people in africa than anywhere else wherefore i see said i and did you get it hmph he sneered did i get it it is evident madam that you have not closely studied the career of rigid er uh, peters did he ever fail to get anything he wanted i don't know i replied that's what i wanted to find out well you may draw your own conclusions he retorted when i speak that beautiful and expressive american word knit i put the word down for future use it is always well for an american to make use of her own language as far as is possible and nowhere can one gain a better idea of what is distinctly of american than from a study of english authors who use americanisms with an apology paid for no doubt at space rates have you been at work on the ocean i inquired no said he why should i work on the ocean i can't improve the ocean excuse me said i i didn't know that you were a purist i'm not said he i'm a peters there was a pause and i began to suspect that beneath his suave exterior mr kipling concealed a certain capacity for being disagreeable i didn't know i said but that you had spent some of your time interviewing the boilers or the engines of the ship a man who can make a locomotive over into an attractive conversationalist ought to be able to make a donkey engine for instance on shipboard seem less like a noisy jackass than it is good he cried his face lighting up there's an idea there god i'll write a poem on the donkey engine as a sort of companion to my mac andrews hymn and what is more i will acknowledge my debt to you for suggesting the idea i'm much obliged mr uh peters i said coldly but you needn't you are welcome to the idea but i prefer to make my own name for myself if you put me in one of your books i should become immortal and while i wish to become immortal i prefer to do it without outside assistance peters nay kipling immediately melted if you were a man said he i'd slap you on the back and call the steward to ask you what you'd have thank you said i under the circumstances i am glad i am not a man i do not wish to be slapped on the back even by a british author but if you really wish to repay me for my suggestion drop your unnatural modesty and let me interview you frankly tell me what you think if you ever do think you have been so meteoric that one naturally credits you with more heart and spontaneity than thought and care very well said he let the cross-examination begin do you ride a bicycle i asked not at sea he replied what is your favorite wheel i asked the last that is sent me by the maker he answered do you use any tonic hair health or otherwise which you particularly recommend to authors i asked i must refuse to answer the question until i have received the usual check said mr er peters do you still hold with the spanish that americans are pigs and that new york is a trough i asked there are exceptions and when i last saw new york i was not a conscious witness of any particularly strong devotion to the pen he answered uneasily and evasively do you like the american climate i asked is there such a thing he asked in return if there is i didn't see it you americans are in the experimental stage of existence in weather as in garment i don't think you have as yet settled upon any settled climate my experience has been that during any week in any season of the year you have a different climate for each day i can say this however that your changes are such that the average is uncomfortable it is hot one day and cold the next baking the third wintry the fourth humid the fifth dry the sixth and on the seventh you begin with sunshine before breakfast follow it up with rain before luncheon and a sleigh ride after dinner it was evident that mr er peters had not lost his powers of observation why have you left vermont mr kipling i asked peters he remonstrated in a beseeching whisper excuse me mr peters said i 
why have you left vermont mr peters that is a delicate question madam he replied are you not aware that my house is still in the market i am instructed said i drawing out my check-book to get an answer to any question i may choose to ask at any cost if you fear to reply because it may prevent a sale of your house i will buy the house at your own price forty thousand dollars said he it's worth twenty thousand but in the hurry of my departure i left fifty thousand dollars worth of notes stowed away in the attic i drew and handed him the check now that your house is sold said i why mr peters did you leave vermont for several reasons he replied putting the check in his pocket and relighting his jinrishka which had gone out in the first place it was some distance from the town i thought when i built the house that i could go to new york every morning and come back at night my notion was correct but i discovered afterwards that while i could go to new york by day and return by night there was not more than five minutes between the trains i had to take to do it then there was a certain amount of human sympathy involved the postman was fairly bent under the weight of letters i received asking for autographs he came twice a day and each time the poor chap had to carry a ton of requests for autographs still you needn't have replied to them i said oh i never tried to he said it was the postman who aroused my sympathy but you didn't give up trying to live in your own house that had cost you twenty thousand dollars for that i said well no he answered frankly i didn't there were other drawbacks you americans are too fond of collecting things for instance i went to a reception one night in boston and i wore a new dress suit and by joe when i got home and took off my coat i found that the tails had been cut off i presume by souvenir hunters every mail brought countless requests for locks of my hair and every week when my laundry came back there were at least a dozen things of one kind or another missing which i afterwards learned had been stolen off the line by collectors of literary relics then the kodak films that continually lurked about behind bushes and up in the trees and under the piazzas were a most infernal nuisance i dare say there are fifty thousand unauthorized photographs of myself in existence to-day even these i might have endured not to mention visitors who daily came to my home to tell me how much they enjoyed my books ten or a dozen of these people are gratifying but when you come down to breakfast and find a line stretching all the way from your front door to the railway station and excursion trains coming in loaded to the full with others every hour it ceases to be pleasant and interferes seriously with one's work however i never murmured until one day i observed a gang of carpenters at work on the other side of the street putting up a curious looking structure which resembled nothing i had ever seen before when i had made inquiries i learned that an enterprising circus manager had secured a lease of the place for the summer and was erecting a grandstand for people who came to catch a glimpse of me to sit on it was then that the thread of my patience snapped i don't mind writing autographs for eight hours every day and i don't mind being kodaked if it makes others happy and if any boston relic hunter finds comfort in possessing the tails of my dress coat he is welcome to them but i can't go being turned into a sideshow for the delectation of a circus loving people so i got out i was silent i knew precisely what he had suffered and could not blame him i suppose i said sympathetically that this means you will never return oh no said he i expect to go back some day but not until public interest in my personal appearance has died out sometimes somebody will discover some new kind of a freak to interest you people and when that happens i will venture back for a day or two but until then i think i'll stay over here where an illustrious personage can have a fit in the street if he wants to without attracting any notice whatsoever there are so many great people over here like myself and lord salisbury and emperor william that fame doesn't distinguish a man at all and it is possible to be happy though illustrious and to enjoy a certain degree of privacy just then the english coast hove in sight and mr kipling went below to pack up his mulligawatney while i drew close to the rail and reflected upon certain peculiarities of my own people they certainly do love a circus 
End of chapter 9「10 of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 The Doreskis. Anne Warrington Witherup. Read by K. Hand. Innkeeper. Read by phone. Edward de Reski. Read by Jim Gallagher. Jean de Resque. Read by Peter Strom. On my return to London, I received a message from my principals at home suggesting that, in view of the possibilities of opera next winter, an interview with the famous brothers de Resque would be interesting to the readers of the United States. I immediately started for Varsov, where I was given to understand these wonderful operatic stars were spending the summer on their justly famous stock farm. I arrived late at night and put up comfortably at a small and inexpensive inn on the outskirts of the city. Mine host was a jolly old Polander who, having emigrated and then returned from America, spoke English almost as well as a citizen of the United States. He was very cordial and assigned me the best room in his house without murmur or a tip. Anxious to learn how genius is respected in its own country, I inquired of him if he knew where the Dereskis lived, and what kind of people they were. Oh, yes, he said. I know them Dereskis very well already. They have one big farm back on the hills. I get my butter and eggs from those Dereskis. Indeed, said I, somewhat amused. They are fine fellows, both of them. Yes, he said. I like them well enough. Their butter is good. And their eggs is good, but their milk is always skimmed. I do not understand it, why they should skim their milk. I presume, said I, that their voices are in good condition? Well, he replied, I don't know much about their voices. I don't ever speak to them much. When I saw them lost, they could make themselves hurt. But you know, they don't need their voices much already. They keep a man to sell their butter and eggs. But of course you know that they are renowned for their vocal powers, I suggested. I don't know much about them, he said simply. They go away for a year or two every six months, and they come back with plenty of money of one kind and another. But I suppose they made it all out of butter and eggs. What is those vocal powers you was talking about? Is that some new kind of chickens? I gave the landlord up as a difficult case, but the next day, when I called at the castle of the two famous singers, I perceived why it was that in their own land they were known chiefly as farmers. The Doreskis, said I, as I entered their castle, some ten miles out of Warsaw, and held out my hands for the brothers to clasp. It was a superb building with a façade of imposing quality, and not, as I had supposed, built of painted canvas, but of granite. To be sure, there were romantic little balconies distributed about it for Jean to practice on, with here and there a dark, forbidding casement which suggested the most base of Edouard's bass notes. But generally, the castle suggested anything but the flimsy structure of a grand opera scene. Their reply was instant, and I shall never forget the magnificent harmony of their tones as they sang in unison, Miss Winthrop, Miss Winthrop, they inquired. The sa ha 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 haim, I sang, and I haven't a bad voice at all. We are glad, sang Jean in tenor tones. We are glad, echoed Edouard, only in bass notes, and then they joined together in. We are glad, we are glad to see you. I wish I could write music so that I could convey the delightful harmonies of the moment to the reader's ear, particularly the last phrase. If a typographical subterfuge may be employed, it went like this. To see you. Start on C and go a note lower on each line, and you will get some idea of the exquisite musical phrasing of my greeting. Excuse me, Jean, said Edouard. But we are forgetting ourselves. It is only abroad that we are singers. Here we are farmers, and not even yourless. True, said Jean. Miss Witherup, we must apologize. We recognized in you a matinee girl from New York, and succumbed to the temptation to try to impress you. 
but here we are not operatic people. We run a farm. Do you come to interview us as singers or farmers? I've come to interview you in any old way you please, said I. I want to see you at home. Well, here we are, said Edouard with one of his most fascinating smiles. Look at us. Tell me, said I, how did you know I was a matinee girl? You just said you recognized me as one. Easy, laughed Jean with a wink at his brother. By the size of your hat. Ah, but you said from the United States, I urged. How did you know that? Don't English matinee girls wear large hats? Yes, returned Edouard with a courteous bow. But yours is an exquisite taste. Just then the telephone bell rang and Jean ran to the receiver. Edouard looked a trifle uneasy and I kept silent. What is it, Jean? Edouard asked in a moment. It's a message from the Countess Poniatowska. She says the milk this morning was sour. Those cows must have been at the green apples again, replied the tenor moodily. It's very annoying, put in Edouard impatiently. That stage carpenter we brought over from the Metropolitan isn't worth a cent. I told him to build a coop large enough for those cows to run around in, and strong enough to keep them from breaking out and eating the apples, and this is the third time they've done this. I really think we ought to send him back to New York. He'd make a good target for the gunners to shoot over at the Navy Yard. What are the prospects for Grand Opera next year, Mr. Derezky? I asked after a slight pause. Pretty good, replied Jean absently. Of course, if the milk was sour, we'll have to send another can over to the Countess. I suppose so, said Edouard. But the thing's got to stop. I don't mind losing a little money in this farm at the outset, but when it costs us fifteen hundred dollars a quart to raise milk, I don't much like having to provide substitute quarts when it sours at sixteen cents a gallon, just because a fool carpenter can't build a cow coop strong enough to keep the beasts away from green apples. I had to laugh quietly, for as the daughter of a farmer I could see that these spoiled children of fortune knew as much about farming as I knew about building lighthouses. Perhaps I suggested it wasn't the green apples that soured the milk. It may have been the thunderstorm last night that did it. That can't be, says Jean positively. We have provided against that. All our cows have lightning rods on them. We bought them from a Connecticut man, who was in here the other day for five hundred dollars apiece. So you see, no electrical disturbance could possibly affect them. It must have been the apples. I suppose I'd better tell Plancon to take the extra court over himself at once and explain to the Countess, said Edouard. Plancon, here too? I cried in sheer delight. Yes, but it's a secret, said Jean. The whole troop is here. Plancon has charge of the cows, but nobody knows it. I wouldn't send Plancon, he added, reverting to Edouard's suggestion. He'll stay over there all day singing duets with the ladies. Why not ask Scalchi to attend to it? She's going to town after the turnip seed this morning, and she can stop on her way. All right, said Edouard. I imagine that will be better. Blancon's got all he can do to get the hay in anyhow. Edouard looked at me and laughed. We are hard workers here, Miss Winthrop, he cried. And I can tell you what it is. There is no business on earth so exacting and yet so delightful as farming. And you are all in it together, I said. Yes, you see, last time we were all in New York, we were the most harmonious opera troupe there ever was. Edouard explained. And it was such a novel situation that Jean and I invited them all here for the farming season, and have put the various branches of the work into the hands of our guests, we two retaining executive control. Delightful, I cried. Melba has charge of the dairy and does a great deal of satisfactory rehearsing while churning the butter. You should hear the spinning song from Faust as she does it to the accompaniment of a churn. Magnificent. And you ought to see little Russitano and Cremonini rounding up the chickens every night, while Barmeister collects the eggs, put in Jean, and Planson milking the cows after Morrow has called them home, and that huge old chap, Tamagno, pushing the lawnmower up and down the hayfields through the summer sun. Those are sights that even the gods rarely witness. It must be a picture, I ejaculated with enthusiasm. And Ancona, is he with you? He is, and he's as useful a man as ever was, said Edouard. He is our head plowboy, and Calvé's vegetable garden. Well, Jean and I do not wish to seem vain, Miss Winthrop. But really, if there is a vegetable garden in the world, 
that produces cabbages that are cabbages, and artichokes that are artichokes, and Bermuda potatoes that are Bermuda potatoes, it is Galvez Garden right here. And what becomes of all the product of your farm? I asked. We sell it all, said Jean. We supply the Tsar of Russia with green peas and radishes. The Emperor of Germany buys all his asparagus from us, and we have secured the broiled chicken contract for the Austrian court for the next five years. And don't you feel, Mr. Derezky, I asked, that all this interferes with your work? It is my work, replied the great tenor. Then why, I queried, do you not take it up exclusively? Singing in a grand opera must be very exhausting. It is, sighed Jean. It is indeed. Siegfried is harder than haying, and I would rather shear six hundred sheep than sing Tristan. But alas, Edward and I cannot afford to give it up. For if we did, what would become of our farm? The estimated expense of producing one can of peace on this estate, Miss Witherup, is three hundred dollars. But we have to let it go at fifty cents. Asparagus costs us fourteen eighty a spear. A lamb chop from the Duresque Lambery sells for sixty cents in a Paris restaurant. But it cost us ninety-seven dollars a pound to raise them. So you see why it is that my brother and I still appear periodically in public, and also why it is that our services are very expensive. We didn't want to take the gross receipts of opera the last time we were in New York, but when the company went to the wall, we'd have gladly compromised for ninety-nine cents on the dollar, had we not at that very time received our semi-annual statement from the agent of our farm, showing an expenditure of eight hundred thousand dollars as against gross receipts of one thousand six hundred and fifty dollars sixteen hundred and thirty dollars said edouard correcting his brother we had to deduct twenty dollars from our bill against queen victoria for those pheasants eggs we sent to windsor three crates of them turned out to be shanghai roosters true said jean i had forgotten i rose and after presenting the singers with the usual check and my cordial thanks for their hospitality prepared to take my leave you must have a souvenir of your visit, Miss Wetherup, said Jean. What shall it be, a radish or an Alderney cow? They both cost us about the same. Thank you, I said. I do not eat radishes, and I have no place to keep a cow. But if you will sing the Lohengrin farewell for me, it will rest with me forever. The brothers laughed. You they ask too, too much, much, they cried. That, that would, would be like, like giving you ten thousand dollars. Oh, very well, said I. I'll take the will for the deed. We'll send you our pictures autographed, said Edouard. How will that do? I shall be delighted, I replied, as I bowed myself out. You can use them to illustrate the interview with, Jean called out after me. And so I left them. I hope their anxiety over their crops will not damage their focal bowers, as the landlord called them, for with their voices gone I believe their farm would prove a good deal of a burden. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Eleven, Heinrich Schenkewitz. Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Hand. Edward de Reski, read by Jim Gallagher. Jean de Reske, read by Peter Strom. Henrik Schiankevich, read by Ellis. Salesman, read by Lian Yao. Maid, read by Lian Yao. On my way back from the Polish home of the de Reskis, it occurred to me that it would be worth while to stop over a day or so and interview Mr. Schiankevich. There were a great many things I desired to ask that gentleman, and he is so comparatively unknown a personality that I thought a word or two with him would be interesting. I had great difficulty in finding him, for the very simple reason that, like most other people, I did not know how to ask for him. Ordinarily I can go into a shop and ask where the person I wish to see may chance to dwell. But when a man has a name like Schenkewitz, the task is not an easy one. When it is remembered that poets in various parts of the United States have made the name rhyme to such words as sticks, fizz, and even vichy, it will be seen that it requires an unusually bold person to try to speak it in a country where words of that nature are considered as easy to pronounce as Jones or Smith would be in my own beloved land. 
however i was not to be daunted and set about my self-appointed task without hesitation my first effort was to seek information from my friends the derezkis and i telegraphed them where can i find shenkovitz please answer with their usual courtesy the brothers replied promptly we don't know what it is if it is a patent medicine apply at any apothecary shop if it is a vegetable we do not raise it but we have a fine line of parsley we can send you if there is any immediate hurry i suppose i ought not to give the brothers away by printing their message of reply but it seems to me to be so interesting that i may hope to be forgiven if i have erred i next turned to the bookshops but even there i was puzzled most of the booksellers spoke french and while i am tolerably familiar with the idiom of the boulevards i do not speak it fluently and was utterly at a loss to know what quo vadis might be in that language so i asked for a copy of with fire and sword avez-vous avec feu et sabre i asked of the courteous salesman it may have been my accent or it may have been his stupidity in any event he did not seem to understand me so i changed the book and asked for the children of the soil n'import said i avez-vous les enfants de la terre excuse me madame he replied in english but what do you want anyhow i want to know where uh the author of quo vadis lives oh said he i did not quite understand you it is so long since i was in boston that my american french is a trifle weak if you will take the blue trolley car that goes up Oyavzdovska avenue and ask the conductor to let you out at the junction of the krakowskie przedmieście and the novi Sviat, the gendarme on the corner will be able to direct you thither good heavens i cried would you mind writing that down he was a very agreeable young man and consented it is from his memorandum that i have copied the names he spoke with such ease and if it so happens that i have got them wrong it is his fault and not mine one more thing before i go said i folding up the memorandum and shoving it into the palm of my hand through the opening in my glove when i get to uh, the author of quo vadis's house whom shall i ask for i fear the young man thought i was mad he eyed me suspiciously for a moment that all depends upon whom you wish to see he said i want to see er him said i then ask for him he replied it is always well when calling to ask for the person one wishes to see if you desire to call upon mrs brown jones for instance it would be futile to go to her house and ask for mrs pink smith or mrs green robinson i know that said i but what's his name the young man paled visibly he now felt certain that i was an escaped lunatic i mean how do you pronounce it i hastened to add oh he replied with a laugh and visibly relieved oh that why Sienkiewicz, of course it is frequently troublesome to those who are not familiar with the polish language it is pronounced Sienkiewicz s i e n k sienk i e e w i c z vich sienkiewicz and so i left him no wiser than before he did it so fluently and so rapidly that i failed to catch the orthopic curves involved in this famous name armed with the slip of paper he had so kindly handed me i sought out and found the trolley car conveyed by signs rather than by word of mouth to the conductor where i wished to alight discovered the gendarme who turned out to be a born policeman and was therefore an irishman who escorted me without more ado to the house in which dwelt the man for whom i was seeking is er the head of the house in i asked of the maid who answered my summons i spoke in french and this time met with no difficulty the maid had served in america and understood me at once yes mom she replied and immediately ushered me into the author's den where i discovered the great man himself scolding his secretary i cannot understand why you are so careless he was saying as i entered in spite of all my orders repeatedly given you will not dot your j's or cross your l's if you do not take great care i shall have to get someone else who will write this letter over again then he looked up and perceiving me rose courteously and much to my surprise observed in charming english miss witherup i presume yes said i grasping his proffered hand how did you know 
i was at the daraska when your telegram reached there yesterday he explained we uh, thought uh, you would be amused by the answer we sent you oh said i seeing that i had been made the victim of a joke it wasn't polite was it oh i don't know he replied it was inspired by our confidence in your american alertness we were sure you would be able to find me anyhow and we thought we'd indulge in our little humour that was all ah i said smiling to show my forgiveness well you were right and now that i have found you tell me do you write or dictate your stories i dictate them he said wonderful said i can you really speak all those dreadful polish words they are so long and so full of unexpected consonants in curious juxtaposition that they suggest barbed wire rather than literature to the average american mind i had a sort of sneaking idea that he would find in juxtaposition a word to match any of his own and so i spoke it with some pride he did not seem to notice it however and calmly responded one gets used to everything miss witherup i have known men who could speak russian so sweetly that you'd never notice how full of jays the language is said he and i have heard englishmen say that after ten years residence in the united states they got rather to like the dialect of you new yorkers and in some cases to speak it with some degree of fluency themselves what is your favorite novel mr er shiankovich he said smiling over my hesitation thanks i said gratefully but never mind that i have a toothache anyhow and if you don't mind i won't don't mention it he said i won't i answered what is your favorite novel quo vadis he replied promptly and without any conceit whatever he was merely candid i don't mean of your own i mean of other people's said i oh said he i didn't understand still my answer must be the same my favorite novel in polish is of course my own but of the novels that others have published i think quo vadis by jeremiah Hartin is my favorite of course it is only a translation but it is good i did not intend to be baffled however so i persisted very well mr er you said i what is your favorite novel in chinese my favorite novel has not yet been translated into chinese he replied calmly and i had to admit myself defeated do you like vanity fair i asked i uh, have never been uh, there said he simply what do you think of pickwick i asked that is a larger question he replied with some uneasiness i thought but as far as my impressions go i think he was guilty i passed the matter over are you familiar with american literature i asked somewhat said he i have watched the popular books in your country and have read some of them and what books are they i asked well Covadis and the prisoner of zender he replied they are both excellent i suppose you never read conan doyle i put in with some sarcasm a man who was familiar with what is popular in american literature ought to have read conan doyle yes he replied i have read conan doyle i have read it through three times but i think dr holmes did better work than that he's a autograph on the breakfast table was a much a better novel than conan doyle and he's the poem the charger of the light brigade is a thing to be remembered still i liked conan doyle he added everybody does i said not really it is a novel that suggests a life a blood insight and all that said my host but of all the books you americans have written the best is mr thackeray's estimate of your american boulevardier 
it was a named if i remember rightly tommy fadden i read that with much interest and i do not think that mr thackeray ever did anything better although his story of jane eyre was very good indeed fadden was such a perfect representation of your a successful american and in reading it one can picture to oneself all the peculiar qualities of your best society really i am grateful to mr thackeray for his tommy fadden and when you return to new york i hope you will tell him so with my compliments i looked at my watch and observed that the hour was growing late i am returning to paris said i so i have very little time left still i wish to ask you two questions first did you find it hard to make a name for yourself very said he it has taken sixteen hours a day for twenty years then why didn't you choose an easier name like lang or johnson i asked what is your other question he said in response when i make a name i make a name that will be remembered shiankovitch will be remembered whether it can be pronounced without rehearsal or not what is your other question are you going to read from your own works in america or not dr doyle dr watson anthony hope matthew arnold and richard la gallienne have done it how about yourself i said mr shankovitz sighed i wanted to but i can't said he nobody will have me nonsense said i have you they'll all have you but he added how can i one must be introduced and how can a chairman of the evening introduce me they have intelligence said i and some of them have so i was quite right yes but they have no enunciation or memory said he i can explain forever the pronunciation of my name but your american chairman can never remember how it is pronounced i shall not go and so i departed from the house of mr shankovitz i can't really see why when he was making a name for himself he did not choose one that people outside of his own country could speak occasionally without wrecking their vocal cords one like boggs for instance end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup, by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve, General Whaler. Anne Warrington Witherup, read by K. Hand. General Whaler, read by Philip Gould upon returning to my london lodgings i was greatly rejoiced to find awaiting me there a cable message from the war department at washington saying that if i would visit general whaler at madrid and secure from him a really frank expression of his views concerning our spanish imbroglio the president would be very glad to give me a commission as first assistant vivandier to the army of the philippines with rank of captain I saw at once that in endeavoring to secure an interview with this particular celebrity, I ran risks far greater than any I had yet encountered, greater even than those involved in my visit to Mr. Kane at his Manx home. It is my custom, however, to go wherever duty may call, and inasmuch as my sex has, since the days of Joan of Arc, secured military recognition nowhere except in the ranks of the Salvation Army, I resolved to accept the commission, and notified the War Department accordingly fortunately my style of beauty is of the spanish type and furthermore when at boarding school many years ago in brooklyn i had studied the spanish tongue so that disguise was not difficult i had seen carmencita dance at a private residence in new york and had therefore some slight knowledge of how a full-fledged senorita should enter a room so that on the whole i went to madrid tolerably confident that i could beard the great spanish lion in his den and escape unscathed 
purchasing a lace mantilla and a scarlet scarf about eight feet long my feet covered with red slippers and a slight suggestion of yellow silk hosiery peeping from beneath a satin skirt of the length prescribed by the rainy day club and armed with a pack of cards and a pair of castanets i ventured forth upon my perilous mission nothing of moment occurred on the journey i did not don my spanish dress until i had left england behind indeed i had reached the pyrenees before i arrayed myself in my costume although i was most anxious to do so it was after all so fetching once in spain i had no difficulty at all and in fact made myself very popular with the natives by telling most charming fortunes for them and dancing the armadillo and the obadil dock with a verve which pleased them and surprised even myself i have always known myself to be a resourceful creature but i had never dreamed that among my reserve accomplishments the agility and grace of a premier danseuse could be numbered it was a friday evening when i reached madrid and saturday morning bright and early i called at general whaler's house a rather stunning banderillo opened the front door and inquired my business tell general whaler i said that senorita gypsy del castellanos de sierra de santiago of newark new jersey wishes to speak with him on affairs of national importance i had resolved upon a bold stroke and it worked to a charm the general who is mortally afraid of assassins had been listening from his usual hiding place behind the hat rack pushing the hat rack from before him he stepped out into the hall and standing between me and the door inquired threateningly if newark new jersey was not one of the dependencies of the united states i answered him in fluent spanish that it was told him that i had lived there through no fault of my own for three years had had to fly before a mob because of my pro-spanish sympathies and traveling night and day had come to lay before him a complete sketch of the fortifications of newark together with the ground plan of harlem which as i informed him he would have to take before he could possibly hope to place washington in a state of siege i also gave him a chart showing by what waterways a spanish fleet could approach and reduce niagara falls to ashes a blow which would strike england and the united states with equal force without necessarily altering the status quo ante with great britain the general like the quick-witted soldier that he is became interested at once the lowering aspect of his brow cleared like the summer clouds before an august sun and with an urbanity which i had not expected invited me to step into his sanctum i accepted with alacrity i cannot say that it was a pleasant room it was in military disorder machetes and murderous looking pistols were everywhere and the chair to which i was assigned was a pleasant little relic of the inquisition and was so arranged that had the general so wished the arms holding hidden iron spikes would fold about me at any moment and give me a hug i should not forget in a hurry added to this was a series of kodak pictures of all the atrocities of which he was guilty while in havana these were framed in one massive oaken frieze running from one end of the room to the other and labeled on a gilt tablet with black letters snap shots i have snapped or pleasant times in cuba this demonstrates that weiler is one of those rarely fortunate people who take pleasure and pride in the profession they are called upon to follow general said i once we were seated did it ever occur to you that if you were two feet shorter and clean-shaven with a different nose and a smaller mouth and a shorter chin and a bigger brow and less curve to your arms when you walk you would resemble napoleon bonaparte the general was evidently pleased by my compliment did you think so said he with a smile which absolutely froze my soul i do i said meekly and then i began to weep I was really unnerved and began to wish I had never accepted the commission. He was so frightfully cold-blooded and toyed with a stiletto of razor-like sharpness so carelessly that I was truly terrified. Don't cry, Gypsy, he said. War is a terrible thing. But we will beat those Yankee pigs yet. This, of course, was before peace was declared. The remark nerved me up again. He believed in me, and that was half the battle. Oh, I hope so, General, I sobbed. But how? Poor old Spain has nothing to fight with. Spain has me, Senorita, he cried passionately. And I, single-handed, will give them battle. But you do not know the country, General, said I. Don't risk your life. I beg of you, our only hope. I haven't a doubt that in a fight with pigs you will win. But, General, the United States is so vast, so complicated, it is full of pitfalls. I could see that I had worked him up. Senorita, he cried, fear not for Weiler. 
think you that I do not know America? Ha ha! I know it every inch. And let me tell you this. It is because I have devoted hour after hour, day after day, night after night, to the study of the United States. And, best of all, they do not suspect it over there. Why? Because of my strategy. When I wished to learn where was situated the city of Ohio, did I send to New York for a map? Not I. I knew that if I bought a map in New York, the house of which I bought it would advertise me as one of their patrons. I am too old a Spaniard to be caught like that. Here his voice sank to a whisper, and leaning forward he added impressively, I sent for a railway timetable. Figures express to my mind what lines on maps could not express to others. What did I learn from the New York Central timetable, for instance? Dees. Ohio is twelve hours from New York. Good, say you. But what does that mean? Traveling at the rate of four miles an hour, Ohio is just forty-eight miles from New York City. Forty-eight miles! Ha! By forced marches, our troops could cover that in teen days. The general snapped his fingers. But why Ohio, General? I asked. The most important city in the American Union, he replied. Ohio captured, we have the home of McKinley. Ohio captured, we have captured 80% of the Yankees' public officials. Your minister of state comes from there. All the vocal powers of the Senate. All their political resource. Ah! He cried, ecstatically rubbing his hands together. They little know me. Let them destroy our navy. Let them take the Philippines. Let them blockade Cuba. Let them do what they please. Spain will wait. Spain will wait a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century. But we least expected a new fleet built secretly, a new army recruiting now on the DQ. This is a translation. We'll dash into New York Harbor, up the Missouri River, through the Raritan Canal, and Ohio we lie at our mercy. And then, said I, overwhelmed, We'll hold Ohio until the pig gives back the Philippines and Cuba, said the general suavely. Now, general, said I, pursing my lips, your plan is a mighty good one, and I hope you'll try to put it through. But let me tell you one thing, your timetables have misled you. In the first place, any part of Ohio worth talking of is 18 hours from New York by rail, not 12. New York Harbor is mined all the way from Fortress Monroe to the Golden Gate, and you can't get to Ohio by a dash up the Missouri River and the Raritan Canal, because those two waterways above Los Angeles are not navigable. It is very evident that you, in studying a railroad map, have forgotten that they are designed to advertise railroads and have no geographical significance whatsoever. Are you sure? he asked. Perfectly, said I. I have lived in the country, as I have told you, for three years, and I know what I am talking about. Dean, what shall I do to attack Ohio? he demanded. Well, said I, the question is not easy to answer, but I think if you would first capture Hoboken— Yes, he said, making a note of my suggestion. And then take your transports, guarded by your fighting ships, out as far as railway, I continued. I have it here, said he, putting it down. Land your troops there, and send 150,000 south to Bangor, and 100,000 north to Louisville, Kentucky, with a mere handful of sharpshooters to overawe the Seminoles at Seattle, and then let the troops close in, said I. I understand, said he enthusiastically. 
If you will do that, I put in, you will come as near to capturing Ohio as any man can come. The general rose up and excitedly paced the floor. Signorita, he said at length, you have done your country a service. But for you, my plans would all have fallen through. Because based upon the unreliable information put forth upon an ignorant people by corrupt railway officials, I have studied with care every railway map issued in the United States fourteen years past. I had supposed that Ohio could be reached by way of the Missouri and the Raritan. I had supposed that to bring about the fall of Nebraska, where their immortal general, for I admit that those pigs have occasionally produced a man, O'Brien leaves. It could be attacked by a land and sea force simultaneously. Should the land forces approach the city from the Chicago side, and the fleet pass the forts at Galveston, and sail up Chesapeake Bay, without further molestation. Hmm, I see from what you have told me that these maps are falsus in uno, anyhow. I am wondering now if they are not falsus in omnibus. I shouldn't be surprised if they were even falsus in trolleybus, I put in, with a feeble attempt at humor. Certainly they have misled you, General. But, he cried angrily, I am not to be thwarted. My ultimate idea remains unchanged. On to Ohio is my watchword. When that falls, the rest will be easy. Thanks to the information you have given, I now know how it may be done. And I assure you, Signorita, that you will not be forgotten. In the... Ah... Uh, the... Here his sallow features grew animated, and a flush of real pleasure crossed them as he finished. In the, uh, reorganization. There is to be a reorganization, then, I asked. Yes. He answered. That is certain, and on the whole, it is good that there is to be. People are always pleased with that which is novel, and up to this time... There have been no kings on the throne bearing the name of Valeriano. I think Valeriano de First will make a very pretty autograph. Don't you? Indeed I do, I cried. Write one for me, won't you? But the sagacious warrior merely winked his eye, and by a swish of his machete courteously gave me to understand that the audience was over. I immediately cabled to Washington the results of my interview, and by the time I got back to London, had the pleasure of reading in the newspapers that the United States Senate had confirmed my appointment of First Assistant Vivandier to the Department of Manila, with the rank of Captain, for services rendered, wherefore I have given up the pleasant task of interviewing celebrities for the sterner duties of war. I was glad also to learn that the administration, acting upon my advices, had taken steps to make Ohio impregnable by sea in any event. The Gibraltar of American politics should not be allowed to fall into the hands of a ruthless Castilian like Weiler, and frankly, whatever else our government will permit, I do not think it will ever do this, and as long as we possess Ohio we need have no fear that we shall be governed by foreign people. The End End of Chapter 12 End of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Witherup by John Kendrick Bangs